Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining us. I'm going to start off this morning by introducing uh, the esteemed panel to my left here. Uh, their full bios are in your program in, if you're interested in, in knowing more. So first, we have Frank Borelli, and Frank is the Vice President, Head of Search and Evaluation at Bexalta. Thank you for joining us. Then we have Oz Assam to his left. You're right, I guess, from the audience. Uh, the Global Head of Cell and Gene Therapy at Novartis. Thank you for joining us. Then we have Olivier Danos, who is the Senior Vice President of Gene Therapy at Biogen. Thank Thank you. Then we have Perry Carson, the CEO of Celgene Cellular Therapeutics. And last, on the other edge of the stage, we have BG Ree, who is the president of Green Cross Holdings. So I think we have a interesting discussion lined up for you today. Uh, most of our questions will focus on the unique role of partnerships in regenerative medicine. Um, but we will make sure to wrap up with at least 10 minutes at the end, so if there's additional questions from the audience that you are really intrigued at knowing the answer to, you will have that opportunity to ask those questions. So I'll start off this morning um, by focusing on the role of partnerships. And actually, I realize that those of you to my right might not be able to see me, so perhaps I'll, I'll stand up as, uh, as opposed to uh, sitting down. So, so far this year, the value of the deal value of M&A investments and strategic partnerships in the regenerative medicine sector has been more than $11 billion, quite a, quite a sizable sum, including over $2 billion in upfront payments. So I'm going to direct this first question to, to Oz. Um, given the size of some of these partnerships, you know, we'll just point out maybe one uh, that many of you are familiar with. You know, the Pfizer and Selectus deal for CAR T was was 2.8 billion in its total total deal value. It might be observed that um, the larger firms are paying a premium for access to technologies. What's your perspective on? Are they recognizing value, um, and, and is it at fair value? Or do you think going forward there'll be a, a shift in the value of these partnerships? It's a great question, a billion dollar question at some point. <laughs> so I think, uh, you know, in probably all the C-suites across the globe in Big Pharma, there's been a reflection on strategic plans and looking at where we're going, okay? And uh, clearly we've been a very, very successful industry uh, based on small molecules, biologics. Um, but there is a reality that a, a third pillar is arriving. And I, many could say, many of you in this room have years of expertise are saying long overdue. Um, and that is the world of regenerative medicine and cell and gene therapy. So I think astute players have been watching the landscape and they are willing to pay a premium. And that goes without saying, right? Uh, what are the dynamics that have played into that? I think it's a dynamic that the, the markets are shifting significantly. There are growth challenges to our industry. Um, and everybody wants to think about successful diversification, but diversifying in a way that makes sense. Yeah. And so certainly for, for my organization, that was a vision that was realized uh, three, four years ago when we did something very bold and courageous, did a, an alliance uh, of a very different sort with the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and we believe that's been highly successful. And I think we'll talk a little bit about that on the partnering side later on. And then um, we had the courage to then put further investments and dedicate an entire business unit uh, to the cell and gene therapies with primarily focus on CAR T therapies, but also obviously acutely interested in looking at, at other therapies as well. So I think it's a reality that um, is going to happen. Uh, the question is uh, how much uh, there's tangible value, there's intangible yeah. value. Um, and some of it remains to be determined, right? But I think we're at a very exciting stage now where in this field we are on the cusp of something magical happening, which is bringing potentially curative therapies to market. So that's my perspective on the question. Excellent. Thank you, Oz. Well, interestingly, the value of the M&A uh, deals has gone down year to date versus last year, but the overall value of partnerships has gone significantly up, suggesting that people are putting increasing focus on building partnerships that aren't the traditional M&A approach. And I'll direct this uh, to Perry and, and to Oz. Uh, what do you think is driving this increased focus on, on partnerships and what would you say that both the licensor and the licensee are looking for? And maybe Perry, I'll start with you. Yeah, no, thank you. 
So, um, you know, what we have found at Celgene is we have broad expertise in a number of areas, but where you really see a lot of the innovation, the focused innovation in the industry is small groups getting together in smaller startup companies that can focus on a specific area, bring smart people and technology to the fore, and advance that. So what we found as we've done our partnerships is we want this to be a win-win. We want to understand what the aspirations are of our partner. And if it is to build their own standalone company, great. We will find a way to, to structure that partnership so that both companies and ultimately patients win. If their investors are looking for an M&A transaction, you know, then we'll contemplate that if the circumstances are right. But I think what you're seeing is a recognition on the part of larger biotech, uh, big pharma, that that innovation is coming from smaller focus groups and to leave those groups intact and provide them with the incentive to advance their technology is really how we're ultimately going to benefit patients with novel technologies. From your perspective, are smaller companies less likely to be interested in an M&A type arrangement than perhaps they have been in the past? Um, I think it really just depends on the management team and the investor base. What you're seeing in many cases, uh, we've done it, other companies have done it, is a build to buy where we will set up a set of milestones and if those are achieved then we will have an option to acquire the company. That in many cases works for both uh, companies. The smaller company is uh, able to build value and to mm -hmm. show that their technology platform really can result in innovative therapeutics. We have the opportunity to collaborate for a while and see if that technology is going to be realized in therapeutics and then ultimately if it makes sense, we acquire. So in those situations, uh, everybody wins. But I think it's really very circumstance-driven ba based on the investor base, the management team's desire, and the smaller companies. But we, as many of my colleagues up here are as well, we're very sensitive to those needs, and we'll structure partnerships because at the end of the day, we want to access those technologies that are going to result in these innovative therapies that we're talking about here and are going to transform the practice of medicine. Excellent. Uh, is your perspective. So, Anything you'd uh, add? I mean, I represent an organization which we play both the role of licensor and licensee, so maybe I'll focus on the licensee bit. So clearly, uh, chemistry is very, very important. It stops and starts with the management team, right, uh, in terms of how well you can gel your existing ecosystem with that ecosystem, so I think that's important. Um, it goes without saying we spend a lot of time on, a, it has to be a, uh, not a me too, it has to be disruptive innovation, which I think goes carte blanche in the, in the field of what we're discussing here today. Uh, I think the other thing that's uh, very, very important is the freedom to operate. The IP <coughs> landscape is critically important for us. Um, and then obviously thinking about the potential for it to be global. So while we've been, I think, uh, an industry, uh, certainly a field that's been very heavily rich in focus in, in the US, in Europe, I think, uh, as it goes without saying, um, a hugely attractive opportunities for unmet need in patients in Japan. Uh, in Asia, uh, in Australia, so looking at a true global platform and another area that you know I think in the future we will have to address will be the uh, Latin America region. Uh, so thinking about just not just the short to midterm, but if we're making investments for a 10 year horizon, where could we go to and how would we go about doing that and do we have all the, uh, um, the freedom to operate in order to do that. So those are some of the things that we would be putting a lens to in terms of assessment and value. Excellent, thank you. So there's been a, a question raised about whether or not two companies can actually have a successful sort of co-marketing agreement or does one company really need to own the commercialization of technologies? And Frank, I'll, I'll tee that one up to you. What's your perspective on that? Uh, well, I think, uh, you know, a partnership uh, only works when the two <laughs> parties involved uh, see a mutual benefit. Uh, the, the kind of small companies we usually interact with and um, I should say that Baxalta is very much into an external innovation model, looking for innovation in small groups. We recognize we don't have uh, a lock on good ideas. But usually these small companies are looking to a global a company with a global footprint, uh, with uh, manufacturing and regulatory experience. Uh, and they're trying to grow up. In, into that space and we're more than willing to discuss any arrangement that will allow us to share the um, co-commercialization uh, let's say but at the end of the day we're we're looking to bring our strength to the table and have it utilized otherwise we you know it doesn't really make sense and the parties usually um, understand that uh, but we're very flexible in terms of what arrangements we're willing to entertain Excellent, excellent. So, 
how do, and, and I'll direct this at, at Perry and, and Olivier, how do you think these funding mechanisms will evolve going forward? What might, what might we expect to see over the next few years that might look different than today? And I'll start with you, Olivier. Well, uh, as you said, it's likely that, that nowadays larger companies are paying a premium for technologies. Uh, that's, that's, that's clear that, that uh, we're also acquiring enable, enabling technologies and, by the way, also products, but that's not the only thing. And, and I guess the, the focus on products will be bad. And so how will it really be translated in, a, in a, the amounts and everything? But, but the, the, the nature of these deals will probably shift to, towards real, more, more products than, than technologies. That's, mm. that's kind of the, the obvious uh, analysis that you can do today. Excellent. Okay. You know, I think it goes along with what we're talking about here, the recognition that a lot of the innovation is coming out of smaller entities, and it's really those people who can drive those technologies forward to therapy. So I think in terms of structuring funding, um, what you're starting to see is larger upfront payments that provide the, the latitude for those small companies to continue to execute along the lines that they have been. What they've been doing has attracted the partnership, and so to allow them to continue doing that is really where the value is going to be added. So in a lot of the deals that we've done and some of our colleagues have done, uh, there's a lot of freedom for that partner to continue to execute and do what they're doing ultimately to deliver those therapies to patients, and the funding mechanism allows for that as well in the structure, as well as in uh, many of the governance mechanisms uh, as well. Excellent, thank you. So, so let's shift a little bit. Frank, you commented, I think, a little bit on, on reimbursement and regulatory. I'm sure it's a, a topic that many people in, in the audience spend some, some time focused on. You know, certainly there is a, a belief, I think, amongst this community that um, many groups will need to work together to make sure that we do have reimbursement for these fairly sort of transformative and sometimes sort of single-use uh, therapies. I'm wondering, and I'll start off with, with Perry and, and Oz, we'd love to have you comment on how you think companies will need to approach the uh, issue of market access. Maybe more specifically, how will large companies work with partners to demonstrate the value of, of this investment, so to speak, in, um, uh, to payers? And how might larger firms be partnering with governments, patient groups, other stakeholders to accomplish that? So, Perry, I'll, I'll start with you. Yeah, so obviously this is a very topical uh, area, okay. especially the last couple of weeks. Uh, pricing, the value of medical innovation, and what we're delivering ultimately to patients and society. And so all of us here are involved in truly transformational therapies. We are changing the paradigm of the treatment of, of many diseases. And along with that transformation on the therapeutic side, we're going to need a transformation in how drugs are reimbursed, how our therapies are paid for. Right now, the, the approach among payers is fairly rigid, it, uh, it, it harkens from the past. We all need to be thinking forward as these transformative therapies are brought to market. If we are able to cure a disease with a single administration of a gene therapy product, how do we pay for that? Now, we're gonna have to come up with mechanisms between industry and the payers that allows market access for these therapies. Um, the way we've done it in the past with small molecules, even with some of the biologics, is gonna have to be transformed as we go forward. And there's a lot of ideas among industry as well as payers. We need to find a way to have those discussions and move forward because what we are doing, all of us, uh, is we are delivering innovation, therapies that are transforming the lives of patients. And that message needs to be communicated throughout uh, the, the country to the public, to the payers, to the legislators. You know, some of the things that we've seen over the past couple of weeks are really um, anomalies into how this industry continues to, to progress. And you look at the, the transformations in what's happened in many major terminal diseases and what we all have the promise of delivering over the next few years. You know, we saw it recently with some gene therapy data. It's phenomenal. So we need to continue to execute there, work with the payers to provide access to these therapies to those patients and transform how we reimburse as well as how we treat. Thank you. Uh, zero perspective. So I want to add a couple of points on to Perry's very good foundational comments there. So um, it I want to link it to the previous question as well a little bit, which is this: the question you asked about commercialization. So I think it would be very foolish of any one organization to assume that they can solve the problem of commercialization and reimbursement. Yeah. Uh, it would be very arrogant for anybody to think that because it's such a unique disruptive space. It's going to require an ecosystem. And I think all the players in this room will probably, I think, generally agree with that sentiment. 
Um, I think there's a lot of things that on the fundamental level we aren't doing enough of, frankly, just from what is in our control. So I think the storyboard for disruptive curative therapies has to be told in a more compelling way. Um, I don't think we have really got across some of the um, outcomes potential that these platforms have for something that's truly curative. In many cases, you know, we're looking at uh, possibly orphan indications to start with, expansion into more uh, larger unmet need, uh, potential sizable populations. But all of that on a backdrop of incredibly high pressure discussions on pricing. I mean, and we have uh, elements within our own industry that are accountable for that, right? When you have price hikes that are frankly unfathomable some, on some occasions. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's proving to be a perfect storm, right? Especially with the political uncertainty in the US. You then start to look at the dynamics of Europe, which has huge shifting population challenges now, vis-a-vis -vis the uh, uh, refugee crisis that are going on. So if you put yourself in the shoes of those stakeholders, it's a very, very different world that they're gonna have to deal with. Now, either we partner with them, or we continue to disagree. Um, so we've gotta meet somewhere in the middle, I think. And at the end of the day, data talks, right? Data is the most yeah. compelling armament we will have moving forward. So I would encourage us all to think more about, and I, and I would in, really encourage a lot of uh, my colleagues here from smaller companies, think about the value story up front. What is it you want to sell in terms of the value-based story aside of the science and technology? Because that's going to be key for this space moving forward, especially for platforms, let's face it, that are going to have initially high cost of goods, it's going to take time before these things are optimized until these commercial models are fully scalable and settled. And none of us want to be in a situation where um, we're facing incredible hurdles with reimbursement um, and challenges with policymakers because they just don't understand the value story. And um, I think that's where I would like to see uh, you know, our industry focus really on the outcome side and getting the basics right of the, the story of what are the alternatives costing now and what do these new therapies, how do you put them into perspective? And, and the dialogues, I, and I have a lot of these dialogues with various stakeholders, externally and internally, uh, on the political scene, on the reimbursement scene. And, and I think there is a sea change that there is a willingness to accept that there will be a disruptive set of therapies that come in the next five to 10 years, uh, but that we will collectively have to grow that ecosystem because it's not built yet. It's still being, it's in its infancy, right? Yeah, and I think both of you alluded to the fact that all companies can be influenced by what one or two companies are, are doing in, in the space. There's a certain amount of, I guess, risk that we all see in the, in the actions that folks may or may not take uh, within the community. And so I'll, I'll, I'll tee this up to, uh, to Olivier. Um, what is your biggest concern about getting market access going forward? Are, are, are you concerned about some of what you're seeing going on right now in the community? Are there other risks you see that we should all be working together to address? Well, one of the concerns certainly comes from the fact that uh, uh, we, you know, we, we, want, we want to get reimbursement and we can get commercialization for treatments that work, right? And in a way, once something works, I'm absolutely sure that there'll be a way. We'll have to invent something probably, but everybody will be moving in the same direction. So if I think it's a bad idea, it would be a bad idea to try to push the legislation, the debate, the, the technical uh, uh, discussions and everything with things that are you know, not, that, not there yet. And um, that's sometimes the problem because you know, we, we also see a value in pushing things that are just not exactly there, but are kind of a you know, proof of concept and we'd like to open yeah. the debate and everything. But on the other side, we see people who are very concerned about the efficiency of treatments <coughs> and payers who say, well, you know, now we're going to start not reimbursing drugs if they're not efficient. And at the same time, we, 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 mm -hmm. we come with something new, which you know, is going to be great, but it's not great yet. Uh, so that might be the, the, the problem. Maybe, maybe we shouldn't rush into, into anything. Maybe we should, we should make sure that we're... And that, that's, it's, a, it's a delicate you know, balancing act. And, uh, uh, but I think this is, this is the... the, the I, think, I think we can make mistakes in this initial phase where things are still evolving and not, not exactly there yet in terms of efficacy, uh, uh, no, real, real treatments being offered to patients. We're still very early. Yeah, Perry. So if I could just add to what Olivia said, I, I agree with you. I think, though, we have to keep in mind that 
the world is a lot different for companies that aren't Biogen, Novartis, and Celgene, where okay. we can, weather through the storms, we can afford to advance our clinical program. If we can't create an environment for small companies and for investors to realize that the long time frame to get a drug, especially what we're talking about here in cell and gene therapy, to move these forward five, ten years, if that structure isn't available to realize a return and to know that there's certainty in terms of intellectual property protection, reimbursement, we're not going to have the investment we need in these novel therapies. And so many of the companies in this room wouldn't be here today if we hadn't had an open window for the last three years that allowed companies to go raise money in the public markets, allowed venture investors to continue to funnel funds into new startup companies. So we do need to project where we hope to be in years to come and create a structure that's going to allow those technologies to advance to therapies and to ultimately realize market access, fair reimbursement, uh, fair intellectual property around the world. Without that framework, you know, we'll, we've seen what's happened in our industry over the years when we've been in those valleys. And without that framework, the funding dries up. And most importantly, the therapies for patients dry up. If we hadn't had the funding over the last few years, would we have 11-year-old children who are hopefully cured uh, by, from leukemia? Would we have possibly sickle cell patients who with one dose see a, a change in their disease, people who are moving toward blindness being able to see? We wouldn't have had all of that. So we need to ensure that framework is in place from the intellectual property challenges we're seeing, from the market access challenges, reimbursement, and from the public's perception of what value we truly are delivering to patients around the world. Excellent, thank you. You know, one of the other topics I know a lot of us have been talking about over uh, the last year is some of the changing regulations that we're seeing globally, particularly in, in Asia. And BG, maybe we can start with you. Do you foresee a change in where we'll see innovation uh, coming from or uh, where we'll see clinical trials being conducted uh, in terms of its global distribution going forward? Well, it looks like, you know, I was invited to represent the Asian territory because you could include a small Korean biopharma company. It's not comparable with these guys. <laughs> but uh, let me talk about the, uh, maybe Korean situation first. Well, as compared to any other industry in Korea, biopharma industry is far, far below. But for the uh, historically, U.S. and the European countries' global market share is more than 70%. Now it comes about 60%. And maybe very soon, next year, it will come down around 50%. In 10, 15 years, the Asian market will be more than 65% of the total global healthcare market. So in that sense, we need a lot of you know, the change in regulation and investment and collaborate with the Asian companies. Well, Korean government set up two uh, issues. One is biosimilar and one is stem cell therapy and gene therapy. As a result, we got the first two or three biosimilar products in the world. Also, we got the first three stem cell products in the world approved. About by today, there are the seven stem cell products approved in the world and the Korea has four products. So, collaborating with the Korean companies or Asian companies. Also, I was in the, in the Japan workshop this morning, there was a great change for deregulation. And I totally agree about that, that policy. And we can move fast for unmet need and untreatable patients. So I w was talking with the main Malaysian companies, Indonesia companies, and also Thailand companies. They were ready to move in, but still there are a gap between the US European companies and Asian companies. So how we can collaborate? for the local production or local clinical trial will be very important issues. And I think Asian companies are ready to move that direction. Yeah. Excellent. And, and as to the extent that you can comment about how your company is, is looking at this, you know, do you foresee significant changes in the sort of global distribution of, of your company's efforts going forward? Yes, yeah, so clearly, I mean, it, um, the kind of model that we, we're going to have to create for these therapies to be scalable and eventually profitable and reach as many patients as possible is going to be um, you know, the big conundrum and the nut to crack. But I think it has to be done in a sequence way. Uh, I mean, our focus is very much on the US and Europe and Japan right now in terms of uh, uh, our most mature offering, which is CAR-T therapies. Um, but I do believe in the next couple of years, one of the players on 
in, in this room are going to be successful in bringing a CAR T like therapy to approval in market. So the clock yeah. is ticking, uh, <laughs> so time is not on our side. Um, and I think what has been transformative has been the manufacturing science and thinking around scalability in terms of the abilities to cryopreserve, the abilities to transport. So, I mean, it makes life somewhat easier, but we also know that from a development standpoint, there is going to be a requirement for some footprint in certain areas yeah. um, from a uh, development standpoint, at least for cell processing. Uh, and I think that's where the role of partnerships are going to be key because, frankly, no big player, certainly not Novartis, is going to go around the world and start to build cell processing facilities everywhere. It just doesn't make sense. Um, so we will need to figure out the right partnerships, and we have struck those partnerships. So publicly, we have uh, made commitments with uh, organizations in Europe, for example, the Fraunhofer Institute, uh, as an example of a, a center that could support us in future times uh, for possible clinical needs if we need it. Right now, we have uh, our own cell processing and manufacturing facility in the US where we conduct all our, our studies now and, and distribute to patients around the world. So it is doable. Uh, but there will be a time towards the end of this decade if these therapies are successful. And let's be honest, at this time point, we don't know with these therapies whether we're looking at tens of patients, hundreds of patients, thousands of patients, tens of thousands yeah. of patients, to your point about the caution that we need to have in terms of the promise here, because let's face it, this is a, a disease therapeutic area where we have let people down, right, in the past historically, uh, through no one's fault, but just the way science panned out. And so I think there, there needs to be an element of caution, but optimism at the same time, and judicious build. Uh, and I think that's certainly what we're focused on in advance, on how do we get that balance right, that making the investments at the right place at the right time now, but have the vision with the right partners to scale up as we move forward. Excellent, thank you. So I'm going to shift, uh, shift a little bit to talk more about sort of the applications that the panel sees as particularly interesting going forward from a cell therapy uh, standpoint. Uh, start off with uh, Frank and, and BG. Do you believe that the excitement that we're seeing right now in terms of immuno-oncology uh, will continue to accelerate? Or do you think this application is sort of reaching a, a point of uh, stabilization? And Frank, I'll, I'll start with you. Uh, I, I think everyone can feel the excitement in the field of immuno-oncology, whether it be checkpoint inhibitors or the CAR T cell cellular space. I, I think that's real. Uh, and having been an immunologist and, and, <laughs> and, and seeing the world evolve, the data is really quite astounding. And, and uh, kudos to those involved. Uh, I don't think there's any doubt that it's real. I, I also think uh, in immuno-oncology, the indication itself lends itself to the pharmacoeconomic arguments that we need to make. Yeah. Uh, you know, everyone in this room probably has someone who's been affected by cancer in their family or yourselves, and, and it, it, it's very tangible. Uh, the pharmacoeconomic argument is, is going to be easier to make here than in a lot of other uh, chronic diseases where we also look at immunomodulation as an yeah. approach. Um, I'm personally, uh, I've been drinking the Kool-Aid. I, I, <laughs> I, I, I think it's real. And uh, I, we've been monitoring, obviously, the leaders in the CAR T cell space and making fantastic progress. Also trying to learn a lot about where are the difficulties, uh, thinking about alternative approaches, because uh, there really are so many uh, uh, parameters to consider, not only the basic science, but even uh, the regulatory manufacturing side. So um, at, at Bexalta, we, we have focused more on the manufacturing side. We're not the innovator, but we're talking to innovators, and hopefully we'll find a nice uh, partnership possibility there. Excellent. BG, what would you add? Well, I agree with the Frank. <laughs> so their CAR T or immuno checkpoint inhibitor is you know, to, it's moving. And the efficacy was already proven, but we don't know about the safety issues. But in Korea, we are collaborating with the Japanese company, and we started launching the product that the immune T cell, cytokine you know, immune T cell, about five years ago. So we have done the very big size clinical trials, about 230 patients for hepatocellular carcinoma and 180 patients for cryoblastoma. And it was approved five years ago. It's been in the market for five years. So far, there is no safety issue at all. 
and uh, that, that demand is growing very rapidly these days. So I guess you know, this kind of a combination with CAR T or even a checkpoint, I think uh, this area will be booming very soon. Thank you, thank you. So this is the next question. I'll start off with, the, with Olivier. You know, there's been a, a lot of debate of how many of these therapies will work as monotherapies or need to be uh, used in, in combination. What do you think the outcome of that answer, uh, what will be the implications for partnerships if most therapies need to move forward as a combination of, of approaches? Um. I mean, th th this is really a case-by-case case, uh, <laughs> uh, question. I mean, I don't think there's a general answer. Some of them, yeah. you know, may, may benefit from being in combination. Some of them, you know, may stand yeah. alone. And, uh, you know, maybe a, a CAR T cell therapy could very well stand alone, actually. Yeah. Uh, now, if, if you, I mean, combinations, they're, they're not unheard of. Uh, it's yeah. been, it's, it, there's a current practice on, on, on doing yeah. that and on, uh, on, on, uh, having alliances and partnership on this type of thing. I, I don't see something very specific with having the, 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 the same kind of uh, organization with cell and gene therapy. Um, so, you know, I, I, I don't see th th there a, 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 an area of, of big, big change. No but, big uh, challenges? Not, uh, not, not, not from my <laughs> point of view, but I may be wrong. I may, you know. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, I think you're right. I think, though, in oncology, we are coming to the recognition that it is going to have to be uh, combination therapies that will ultimately transform these diseases into chronically treated conditions, and immunotherapy is playing a large role. We're going to figure out going forward what the right administration schedule is for some of these uh, checkpoint inhibitors and other immunotherapies. But we're seeing some novel models for collaboration within the industry. Uh, a number of companies are teaming up either in uh, structured partnerships or sharing of molecules and data to ensure that we're able to develop these combinations and advance them. And most importantly, the regulators are being very open to looking at novel, novel combinations and not requiring uh, approved drugs before you can do those combinations. So it's taking a change in the whole ecosystem, which is very important, to advance these therapies and ultimately turn these into chronically treated conditions. And again, we're going to ha have to work with the payers because these combination therapies mm -hmm. are going to be expensive and how best do we uh, provide that market access. Frank. Uh, I just wanted to add, you know, we're talking about combinations, but we could also talk about appropriate sequencing. Sure, definitely. That makes sense. Yep. And, and that's probably uh, more likely to happen because yep. testing molecules still has to happen today on a one on one uh -huh. uh, basis. Um, and, and the pharmacoeconomics of it don't lend itself to adding expensive molecule on top mm -hmm. of expensive molecule. Yeah, definitely, definitely a challenge. You know, there are a, a lot of folks who obviously see a lot of opportunity for cell therapy in other uh, applications, other disease areas, a lot of excitement around areas like cardiac, metabolic, uh, CNS. You know, what's your perspective on which areas are likely to get the most uh, investment going forward? And, and I'll start off with you, Oz, and then I'll go to Frank and BG. Okay, so where, where the, who's going to get the big investments? Okay. Um, <laughs> Look, I can talk to you about the areas that have interested me personally and the areas that Novartis looks at from outside of the, the sort of core immuno-onco space. So clearly, uh, cardiometabolic is potentially huge, right, because the, the unmet need is still there, right? Yeah. So I, I think that that is a field that's had some bumps, but some exciting headroad uh, as well. Um, so I see that as a, as a field that will always remain attractive just because of the size of population and demographics. Um, clearly, CNS. Uh, with especially aging populations. Uh, that's an area you know, we've made big investments in uh, over the day, another transformative set of deals, I would say. Um, you know, also, the whole concept of aging, uh, we spend a lot of time, as of other companies, focusing on frailty and aging. Um, and you know, some of the personal areas in the Vartis we're very excited about are gene therapies for uh, hearing loss, for example, so we're developing <laughs> Uh, in proof of concept stage, potentially a treatment uh, uh, called uh, CFG166 uh, that's being developed for uh, uh, sensory neural hearing loss. So the potential yes. potential to cure deafness in patients who really are have no other option where they really, really are suffering with extreme deafness. So um, I think those are the kind of game-changing areas we're interested in, but I think from a personal standpoint, 
I would say that probably the investments I could see happening in the future if I had a crystal ball would likely be in the cardiometabolic arena, CNS arena is the big unmet needs. Um, and I, I think the other one that clearly that already is making such fantastic progress in the past couple of years and a couple of weeks and months really is the, the, the retinal space and the visual yeah, space as a absolutely. whole. And clearly Novartis is a, a huge interest in that because of our Alcom eye business as well. Uh, so we watch that space very, very carefully as well. Excellent. BG, what would you add to that? Well, definitely CNS, you know, or even today, the cardiac or metabolic disease you have enough drug, and uh, you, you, even you can control with the diet or in exercise, but for the CNS, there's no <coughs> drug and no therapy at all. So I guess uh, this indigenous medicine area, CNS is the right choice and the right direction for them. Excellent. Thank you. Frank, anything you'd add to that? Well, uh, well I'd say, you know, uh, I'd echo the, the comments already made that there are these big unmet problems, especially in the CNS space, uh, uh, cardiovascular metabolism space. But I work for a company where we have key focus areas that don't quite fall there. <laughs> We're in uh, hematology, immunology, and oncology. Mm -hmm. and, but within those spaces, I think what makes good business is uh, developing drugs that really address important unmet medical needs, wherever they may be. So uh, Baxalta inherited the uh, hemophilia business, for example, uh, from Baxter. And uh, that's a business that's been uh, evolving over the past 50 years, from the plasma-derived factors to the recombinant, to the long-lived modified recombinant, and now maybe gene therapy. Um, so there is an envelope to push here and we can get better. There are still patients with severe disease that you, 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 know, you wonder why in the 21st <laughs> century we haven't yeah. licked a hemophilia yet, but that's the truth of the matter. So we'll focus on our core areas. Excellent, thank you. So we're, we're, we're gonna pivot now uh, to a couple questions on technology innovation. Um, clearly there's a lot of needs, there's a lot of companies trying to find innovations that address uh, some of those needs. So, um, Olivia, maybe, maybe I'll start off with you. In terms of recently launched technologies or technologies you see sort of coming to the forefront of cell therapy in the next few years, are there one or two that you're most excited about in terms of how they'll enable cell therapy going forward? Um, well, I think most, most of the I mean, a lot of the progress we've seen with cell therapy and, and what, what has made it possible now uh, has been with, at the beginning, rather mundane ways of growing cells. I mean, it looks kind of uh, obvious. But, <laughs> so I'm, I'm exaggerating because it's not that obvious, right? But what I'm saying is that the, the, it's, not, it's not with a big fancy thing that somebody dreamt of and <laughs> made it happen. No, no, it was about taking cells out of the patient's body and preserving their quality and everything and making sure they grow, they expand, they can be, yeah. you know, and this has been years of work, uh, uh, you know, finding the right cocktail, finding the right thing, and the people who did that, I mean, yeah. are, have to be <laughs> congratulated and, and, and that's, that's really what advanced the field at the beginning, right, for, 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 for in this example. What I'm saying is that we're not, necessarily looking all the time at some very high-tech fancy thing happening, yeah. right? Now, on the high-tech fancy side of things, you know, obviously gene editing is very important. Nobody's going to say <laughs> contrary. So that's very important. Still needs to be uh, mastered and, 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 and uh, domesticated, I would say, <laughs> and adapted to our, to, to our needs. But uh, so uh, that, that, and, and, and having said that, there are still pieces missing in the technology. For instance, there are very important things we can't do today, like once we've transferred a gene in, into a cell, uh, whether it's uh, a cell growing, uh, that we grow ex vivo or directly in vivo, we're unable to control the level of expression of the gene. We can't do that. I mean, we can't do that in a clini clinically meaningful way. There's no device that really allows you to do, to do this. So, in this situation, that really limits the, 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 the breadth of applications that you can think about, right? If you were able to do that, if the technology was coming up with new ways of doing that, immediately, you know, you could do many, many other things, right? So, 
I, I think there are, there, are, there are still things to come that, that will you know, amaze us and uh, will give us uh, things to talk about for the future years. <laughs> Excellent. I certainly hope so. Uh, uh, Oz, anything you would, you would add to that? So I think Olivia gave some really nice perspectives there. I think there's, uh, there's probably a need to balance sort of reality and what needs to happen now for this field versus um, you know, some of the more um, you know, ideas that need maturing. I would say. So gene editing clearly, I mean, phenomenal progress made um, and a lot of players in this room that have really had a first hand shaping that, you know, colleagues at Sangamo and others that uh, pioneered and now it's been picked up in another way with CRISPR and other things. But uh, at the end of the day, proof of concept is needed. So I would add caution, right? Clinical proof of concept trumps <laughs> everything right at the end of the day. Um, on the other pieces of enabling innovation, I think it's important um, to think about the areas where I, I see progress made, but a lot of progress yet to be made. So if you think about the whole end-to-end -end system of saying, I'll, I'll, I'll use the CAR-T therapies as an example, because that's a, the world that I uh, you know, operate for the majority of my time in this field. Um, you know, we, and Olivia nailed it, you know, we, we are still dealing with very primitive processes, although progress made. <laughs> in terms of enabling cells to culture, grow, grow divide, to transduce, and, and, and to be made more potent in that regard. So I think at every step of the process, be that in a CAR-T process, be that in a graft versus host disease model, whatever you're looking at, I mean, we still have a lot of innovation that needs to happen on the manufacturing side side. So start with the apheresis process, okay? Collecting yeah. cells for any patient with any of the therapies that all of us are trying to develop. I mean, that's a, that's a whole ecosystem in itself, right, that needs to yeah. be standardized. And we talked a lot yesterday, I recall at the ARM meeting, uh, the board of directors meeting around the, the desperate need for standardization. You then go through every step of the process there. There are touch points in which real innovation, I think, is starting to happen, but real focus need, is needed now to make these uh, therapies a reality from a scalability perspective. And why it's so different to small molecules and biologics is that we have to reverse translate and reverse engineer the first version of whatever we produce in a cell therapy setting to increase and enhance. Certainly that's the vision we have for platforms in the CAR-T space, that the first offering we have isn't going to be the only offering. There is going to be process optimization, process improvement, and if you do that along the lines of traditional pharma and regulatory thinking, there's no innovation there, yeah. you know, because that's just not the way it's going to work. We have to be quicker, and manufacturing science innovation is going to be key to the success of those future offerings. It's not just, I mean, whatever, whoever comes out first with, you know, the, the, the therapies at a scalable level, it will be a version 1.0, because benefit risk will change, populations will change, and we'll need to get better and adapt. Uh, our processes to that and so I'm, I'm excited by it, I'm fearful of it as well, there's a lot of work to be done but I, w I would ground us in reality that those are the areas that I think we need to really look as enablers for this ecosystem to really flourish. Now you, you both talked about technologies that might be used in the research space right now and, and the need to evolve them to take them to more of a, a clinical setting. Perry, any additional comments you'd make on sort of evolving those technologies where you see some of the key needs there? Yeah, so I totally agree with every uh, with my <laughs> colleagues up here that the clinical data is really what's going to drive this, that we need to take those yeah. technologies and find ways to get them into the clinic and, and show that they're actually treating patients successfully. But I think in a sense though, we are coming to almost to a golden age in cell and gene <laughs> therapy. This has been going on using the immune system for, for decades now and here we are finally realizing a lot of the molecular biology work, the clinical work that's been done, and it's all coming to the fore. I think also we'll look back three, five years from now and say what we were doing today was crude and <laughs> how could we have done that because the advances will be so significant. Um, but I think making these technologies easier to use from a clinical perspective are going to be key. We talked about how to grow cells, but can we move from autologous to allogeneic, uh, uh, CAR-T and, and other, uh, will we be able to use small molecules to transdifferentiate cells rather than uh, you know, doing them uh, ex vivo, do them in vivo. So continuing to find ways that are going to make it easier for clinicians to administer these technologies and have an impact on patients and reduce the cost so that economically we can mm -hmm. make an argument for the value that we're adding. But we're in a very exciting area. The analogy that we use within our organization is this is monoclonal antibodies maybe 25 years ago when people were searching around for ways to use antibodies. Could they actually work against a solid tumor, <laughs> much less a hematological malignancy? And you know, now there's not a company without an antibody. We think the same thing is going to happen in cell and gene therapy over the next years. 
So uh, one more question, I think, for our, our panel before I'll open it up to questions from the audience. And I, I assume that we have some esteemed colleagues in the back who will have a microphone of, of some sort ready. Um, so, so one more uh, question to the panel, and, and BG, I'll, I'll start off with you. There's been a, a lot of discussion regarding sort of the benefits and challenges with both autologous and allogeneic approaches. From, from your perspective, are they both here to stay? Um, do you foresee that both of these approaches will be uh, leveraged going forward? And if so, you know, any, any perspective on, on what your company is most interested in? Well, as I told you, we are already selling the autologous T cell on the market. And for safety issue, maybe autologous shows better than the allogenic. Also, we are working for the, another allogenic NK cell in clinical trials. That maybe we have done about 18 patients for you know, the first in the world for the allogenic NK cell therapy. And for the allogenic, it's good for the commercial wise, you know, but uh, for the safety issues, uh, we don't know yet. So for some time period, I think the two track will go, you know, for a while. Yeah. Excellent. Frank, anything you'd, you'd add to that? Well, uh, there is a major dichotomy between autologous and allo uh, type of cellular therapy because the autologous cells might be there for the rest of the patient's life. And so you have uh, safety concerns that you have to you know, take into consideration. Whereas uh, at least allo genetic uh, uh, CAR T cells are expected to die in four to eight weeks. So you can look for the pharmacodynamic effects, uh, tumor uh, responses, mm -hmm. but you can almost rest assured that the, the drug, as it were, will be gone in uh, two months. So uh, it kind of caps the liability going out further. So I'm, I'm going to open it up for questions from the audience. Maybe we could uh, make it uh, a I guess it doesn't need to be too much brighter in the room. And then at the very end, before we close, I'll give each of you a chance if you want to chime in and say anything that we haven't talked about yet. Um, let's see. Do we have a, a microphone? Ah, one right there and one right there. Any questions from the audience? We can't have hit them all already. There must be some left out there. Uh, Brian. So I'll start it off while everybody else gives a, gets a chance to think. Um, so five to ten years ago when small companies were approaching large pharma or large biotech considering partnerships in this space, uh, one of the things that always came up was it didn't fit into the, the pharmaceutical paradigm of manufacturing and distribution. But yet the first deal that really kicked off the current Tata and CAR T cells was with an academic institution in, in an area that really you know, is autologous setting, manufacturing not well defined. So it seems like maybe we worked through some of that and the clinical efficacy really drove, uh, drove the, the deal. So I guess the question is, what other areas are currently on the radar for, uh, for you all besides clinical efficacy? It certainly is dominant, but are there other red flags that come up regarding manufacturing, reimbursement scenarios, cost of goods? Uh, and I, I'm sure you look at it as a, you know, very holistically, but Aside from clinical efficacy, what are potential red flags that really pop up when you're looking at doing partnerships or, or acquiring new technology? I'll look to anyone at odds to start. Um, okay, so good, good question. So all of the above, <laughs> okay, to be very candid with you. Um, I think the risk assessments uh, are, are done on all of those uh, moving forward. Uh, but I think the for certainly those players that have decided to invest in this space, and it's not all the big players, and neither will all the big players get into this space, okay? Because it's dependent on individual risk benefit, your own portfolios, your own strategies, and how comfortable you are departing from a traditional farm model. Um, so I think there's been a, a, a definitely a realization in companies like Novartis that um, the manufacturing science and scalability of this would have to be done in a different ecosystem out of the, the larger setup of a small molecule or biologic setting. Now, having said that, there's important leverages that we need to, to synergize, and that's, that's the beauty of, of what I, I have in my organization, is that while we're standalone and we have our own manufacturing capabilities, there's a lot of expertise and skill sets in large organizations when it's dealing with supply chain distribution, risk assessment, audits, regulatory interfaces, so all these things really help. Um, so there's a, there's, a, there's a pro and con of, of developing that ecosystem in a, in a big environment. 
I think moving forward, uh, the other areas you touched on a lot of them. I mean, one of the things that we are very challenged in the sound gene therapy space, which I think many in this audience will know, is the prediction from preclinical to clinical just doesn't pan the same way as it does in other settings. And so the speed to get to a proof of concept clinically, I think, is going to be a big differentiator in this space versus uh, traditional small molecule and biologic spaces. So, and we look at this a lot, right, in terms of how much more, how many more additional rat models and mice models can we really do because we're still getting, you know, tox profiles that in small molecule settings you, you'd have killed the programs a long time ago. But it's a different way of development, right? So these are the other areas that I think we are um, scratching our heads more and more in terms of the basic science and the preclinical phase to, to the clinical bridge um, and how do we get a level of comfort that allows us to execute quickly on proof of concept in these settings. And it is pretty remarkable if you think about it. I mean, from, from uh, aspects like CAR-T therapies, potentially you've gone from proof of concept, clinical proof of concept, to potentially coming to market within seven to eight years. I mean, that's unheard of in our industry, right, when we've all grown up with life cycles of 14, 15, 20 years or whatever. So um, it's very exciting, it's very innovative, but there are some areas, as you've mentioned, all of them that are lenses and filters we all apply moving forward. Um, but those risks were, were thought of a couple of years ago when some of these deals were started to be done. It's not that they weren't there. It's just that now we're more well informed that there'll be another level of scrutiny looking at these parameters. But out of all the lists that you mentioned, for me personally, probably reimbursement and access and policy around that is going to be the number one story. How do we evolve and create a value story that makes sense? Showing that we've got standards of care that could be trumped with some of the therapies we're making. And how do you command the appropriate price point for innovation? Uh, Olivia and then Perry, I think you both wanted to make a comment. Yeah, I think just, just to, to add more on that, uh, you know, we've been operating in a drug development and regulatory framework that was uh, originally made for small molecules, mo most of it, right? And then had to evolve when biologics came. Yeah. And, uh, and it's, it's a continuous evolution, but we're, we're now Face, face with new problems. You know, how do you define things like target engagement with the gene therapy vector? What's the, what's kind of, what is PKPD? I mean, the whole, the whole thinking about that needs to be different. Sometimes we don't even have the tools, so we have to you know, build tools for imaging things. So, so it's, uh, it's, we, we, can't, we can't just take some you know, ready-made roadmap to, for drug development and just say, well, you know, this is the way we're professional. We know how to do that, so we're going to take gene therapy and do it. Uh, so it, it's a good exercise, but, but we, 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 when we do that, we just realize that we have to invent new things, basically. So this is, and this takes time, and this is, uh, this, so even at this step, you know, even once we know we had a rather robust technology, we're convinced, we, we, at, at these steps of really doing the drug development, it has to be very, you know, it involves creativity and, and, yeah. and new things to be uncovered. Continuing to innovate, yeah. even just to bring it forward. Per. No, I would just add that I think these are excellent points because one thing we haven't talked a lot about is the regulatory environment. And as we are inventing new preclinical models to translate into the clinic, working with regulators is key. We're developing a whole new area of regulatory science from manufacturing to the preclinical to the clinical. We have found, at least in the U.S., the regulators to be very forthcoming and to be willing to work with us on all of those fronts. They want to see these therapies advance to patients as much as we do. So that's going to be another important area as, as we talk about reimbursement and new paradigms in reimbursement. We're going to need those in regulatory science as well to advance these into the clinic as quickly as possible to see if the efficacy is truly there. Excellent. I think we have time for at least one more question. Gentleman in the front and the gentleman to the left. If we could have the two mics to those two right there. Is that a Sorry, I have a question on, on the uh, topic of reimbursement and pricing. Uh, because I see from the panel uh, uh, you know, a, a proposition to, to really carefully consider value uh, arguments and value pricing uh, as an argument to get appropriate reimbursement. On the other hand, you see developments in the market for uh, more opportunistic, which you may call renegade pricing, which may very dramatically negatively affect uh, this this part of the industry because it's more fragile than other segments and looking for ideas from the panel on how we can protect ourselves from that sentiment 
uh, in on the one hand, you know, trying to come with a careful argument for pricing, and at the same time being hit by other developments that for players that may not adhere to those uh, standards. That's an excellent yeah. question. <laughs> you, you know, the vast majority of our industry, the vast majority, is focused on developing innovative technologies into therapies to treat patients, and we all need to be advocates for our industry and be out there and telling the story. Uh, you know, if you look at just our industry organization, Pharma immediately issued a statement regarding some of the pricing that have been going on the last couple of weeks. Uh, Bio returned the membership dues for a company that was raising prices because that company did not fit the profile of the kinds of companies that are members of Bio. So these anomalies are going to happen in our industry, unfortunately, and in others, and we just need to be advocates for what we're doing, which is in this room, the innovation that's going on that's delivering novel therapy, therapies to patients is profound, and we need to be advocates to, for that and make sure that legislators, politicians, the public really understand the value that we're uh, delivering to patients. Mm -hmm. yeah, Excellent. I'd, I'd go back to the comment I made earlier um, about how do we do a better job of describing the patient journey and the cell journey in our case? And I still think we have a long way to go to crystallizing that very clearly from a data standpoint, unmet need epidemiology standpoint. And if we assume that what we're developing are potentially curative therapies, not, not a bridge to transplant or something, but a really truly curative in the, in the, in the setting of, say, uh, CAR therapies as an example, um, then I think without, uh, we can get the balance and strike it right. However, I think, uh, you know, Perry laid it out, you know, there are rogue elements in our industry that we cannot control, right? Where there will be very short-term myopic thinking around pricing. And I think as an industry, we have to have the courage to see this through for the next five to 10 years. Um, not just think about the short-term win, but think about how you're gonna develop this ecosystem for the, the, the whole healthcare dynamics. Let's face it, in the, in the therapies we're developing, we're learning ourselves, right, as we're developing commercial business models. Think about it from the point of view of the end user, the patient, and the actual healthcare system that's gonna administer, administer that treatment. There's still a learning curve for them as well, right? And so I think it, I would encourage us to still think about the basics and getting the messaging right around that um, in terms of what is standard of care, if something is truly potentially curative, what are the trade-offs that you're making? And to your point, the pharmacoeconomic arguments would flow out of that. And I think we've started to do that, but the packaging hasn't happened yet. And I think, I believe it will happen in the next couple of years because it will be forced to happen. I mean, there is gonna be a reality. One of these therapies will get approved in the next few years. We're, we're very, very close to therapies that I think potentially will, may start off as an orphan, uh, indication but expand very quickly to larger population, at least that's what I believe. And so for that, that, that value story has to be articulated in a way by all of us because it's a symbiotic relationship, right? Whoever is the first player out there would say a CAR T therapy, if they don't get it right, it will have a consequence on the rest of the ecosystem, particularly on other cell and gene and regenerative therapies. So this is a, it's a very important issue that we need to get our heads around. And uh, I don't think there's a magic bullet for this, but it will require compromise and trade-off from all parties. You know, just one final sentence on that, I'm okay. sorry. You know, just if you looked at the New York Times over the last week on the front page, you see the dichotomy of the industry. There's an article about pricing and, and raising prices for all drugs, and there's an article about gene therapy and how it may cure uh, various forms of blindness. So we need to be emphasizing the innovation that we're delivering. There are going to be those rogue elements, but the innovation that we're delivering to patients is profound, and we need to be out there telling that side of the story. Yeah. All right, I think we can just squeeze in one more quick question. Okay, I have a question that was raised uh, previously regarding intellectual property. Uh, in the era that we are now, the discovery, uh, what are your thoughts about intellectual property and the ability to patent various discoveries or products uh, in the changing environment in our time uh, to bring these products forward? I'd like to hear your comments about that. You know, if I may just start off on that, uh, intellectual property is only one protection that uh, innovators have. Uh, especially when talking about a product as complex as a cellular therapy, mm -hmm. there's a lot of know-how 
that never makes it out into the public domain. Mm. So long as you can uh, you know, show that you can do whatever you do uh, consistently and reproducibly, it, it can be a very valuable protection. There's also orphan drug uh, data exclusivity. Uh, so you don't have to have a lock on a whole platform technology in order to uh, get an application into a specific indication and then be protected because you were there first. Um, so the IP is important, but it's only one leg of the stool. I think the, the other thing is that um, the maturing of the system is that you don't need to own all the IP estate. And I mean, some of us have grown up in a world where it was always you had to have complete freedom. You can, have, you can have freedom in other ways, right? So I think you're going to see more of the approach of licensing IP, et cetera, mm. as opposed to this sort of desire that you've got to have all the IP estate. Clearly, in certain areas, it helps to have that, especially at an early stage. But, I mean, if you're looking at wider ecosystems for cell gene therapies, we're going to be relying on a lot of uh, licensing arrangements as well. The trick is you've got to have very smart IP attorneys and very good business development colleagues with you to make sure that everybody gets a win-win around it. So I, I think there's a... Uh, there's a shift in mindset around IP, certainly, that it's critically important, but there are many ways to skin the cat. And to your point, that's, it's one element, right, of what you're looking at value. Perry, did you want to add to that? No, just that I think we're all also, as an industry, going to need to be vigilant because the policy around the IP is shifting, the whole IPR area, uh, the different view of the tech industry versus the biopharmaceutical industry. So it's an area that we'll need to continue to work on and make sure we have that protection because, again, early stage investors are going to want to make sure that there is a framework for having that exclusivity for a period of time before they invest. But uh, you're right, it is shifting. There's more collaboration, but it's, it'll be important going forward. We need to be vigilant. So um, with that, we are, we are out of time. I'm, I'm going to wrap us up. I'm sure these conversations will continue over the next couple of days. Thank you very much to our panel. Thank you for your insights.